From KUNC and the NPR Network, this is In the NoCo, a daily slice of Northern Colorado news and happenings. It's Friday, March 29th. I'm Erin O'Toole. Temple Grandin sees the world through a different lens. It's what we know as neurodivergency, which basically means your brain functions differently than the so-called typical brain. Grandin's differences as an autistic person have been foundational to her work, especially when it comes to the humane treatment of animals. She's a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and is an author and advocate for neurodivergent thinkers of all ages. Today, we're listening back to my conversation with Grandin about why our world needs a diverse range of thinkers. I begin by asking her about her own perspective. Well, I was just a really autistic kid, no speech until age four. And I'm what's called an object visualizer. That's a proper scientific name. And in my book, uh, Different Kinds of Minds, which is the young reader's edition, and in the adult version that came out a year ago, I go over the research that different kinds of thinking actually exist. There's the object visualizer like me who thinks in photographs. All my memories are stored as photographs. And there's the visual spatial mathematical pattern thinker. And there are different kinds of thinkers. And then you have verbal thinkers. And a lot of people that have a label like autism, dyslexia, ADHD, maybe an extreme object visualizer, maybe an extreme mathematician, less likely to be a mixture. Now, my kind of mind, the object visualizer, where there's a problem is with higher math. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to make, I majored in psychology, so I could dodge a whole bunch of math classes. (laughs) Right. But uh, I could never could do algebra. But when I got out into the cattle industry and started working on designing equipment, I discovered that there was always people working in the shop that could not do algebra, but they were inventing mechanical equipment. There's this whole other part of engineering I call the clever engineers. And they're the shop that. people that often don't get enough credit. People like me uh, inventing the equipment. And then your mathematical engineer, let's say to make a food processing plant, for example, he does the mathematical part, boilers and refrigeration, make sure the roof doesn't collapse. So there's two parts of engineering. Right. Well, and I love this because you are such an advocate for the idea that we need all different kinds of minds in our world. Um, You gave it a TED Talk about this a little over a decade ago. Why is that so important that we don't have an education system that's geared toward turning out a bunch of people who all think the same way? Well, we need the object visualizers to keep things running. Uh, The people I worked with, like in the Montfort Fab Shop, for example, and that's closed now, uh, they're all retired. One of the problems is that um, the object visualizers like me are getting screened out because we can't do the higher math. We can't graduate from high school. But I worked with people like in the Montfort Fab Shop that could not um, do algebra and they were inventing things. And the problem is they're all retired out now. So what's this going to do? Well, you need our object visualizers to fix things. I've been on some very questionable elevators recently that are not getting serviced. Mm -hmm. And that's the perfect job for someone like me, the object visualizer, because people go, oh, well, computers run everything. Computers control mechanical devices. Computers are not going to fix an elevator. Chat GPT is not going to fix an elevator. Yeah. In fact, the hands-on jobs are safe. AI is not going to touch these jobs. Mm, that's good to know. Well, we know there's still a lot of work to be done to support people with autism and, and others who process information in different ways especially children. Could you talk about your new book um, for younger readers, Different Kinds of Minds? Different Kinds of Minds is a young reader's edition of visual thinking. And I explain, first of all, about the different kinds of thinking, how we need the different thinkers. And I'm very worried about the um, object visualizers like me who are bad at math getting screened out. So what we can do to help support some of these kids, I'd put all the hands-on classes back in the schools. Hands-on classes like shop. Like shop, sewing, mm-hmm. cooking, woodworking, music, all kinds of things. Because the way that you can help the kid that thinks differently is expose them to a lot of stuff and you find out what they're good at. For example, with me, when I was seven, it showed up very plainly. I was good at art. And my mother encouraged me to do lots of kind of art. And if you could make it out of cardboard, I built things out of cardboard, but kids aren't doing those kinds of things today. Fourth grade, I had a little toy sewing machine that actually sewed. It was my favorite thing. Wow. What did you make? Uh, Costumes for the school play. 
It's really a shame that a lot of those classes have been cut out of many school systems just in the interest of either saving money or focusing on, I guess, what people think are the more valuable learning skills. Well, the thing is, visual thinking, the way I think, is a different way of problem solving. You see a solution to a problem. I'll give you a simple example. I go on a vet clinic. Dogs are slipping around on this very slippery floor in their front lobby. Mm -hmm. and it, it was a good floors in good condition, expensive to replace. So I just visualized plastic runners put down that have a non-slip surface and you just put those down for the dogs to walk on. I just saw it. Okay, that's a simple example of seeing a solution to a problem. Well, we know that there are millions of adults in the U.S. who exhibit some form of neurodivergence and the unemployment rate can be very high. You talk about preparing people for the workforce. I'm wondering how you see this. How how could companies or organizations not only accommodate people who think differently, but see them as a valuable asset? Well, when I was working out with the heavy construction on the meatpacking plant construction, I'm going to estimate that 20% of the people that built things for me were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I have grandparents come up to me all the time uh, that find out they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. So how come a grandfather has a job? Because he learned work skills at an early age. And we need to find replacements for the old paper routes that taught work skills. Let's have your child who's autistic walk the neighbor's dog. Do a church volunteer job. That's a perfect example of a task outside the family on a schedule. That needs to start at a young age. We're also not teaching enough life skills, shopping, laundry, bank account, saving money. The other problem we got with autism is you've got fully verbal kids, but the employment rate for some of them is really bad. And then you also have ones that are, don't speak and they may have other problems such as epilepsy. It is a broad spectrum. Sure. Well, I want to just wrap up by asking you, Temple Grandin, what would you like people to understand about neurodivergent thinkers? We need their skills. We need them. Who's going to fix the elevator at the Denver airport, which last week when I pushed the button would not take me to the second floor of the parking garage? Fortunately, the door let me out. Thank goodness. We want to have water systems at work, power systems at work. You're going to need your neurodivergent people. And you're going to need both the object visualizers and you're going to need the mathematicians. to Keep the lights on. Find out more about Temple Grandin, including links to her new books in our show notes and at KUNC.org. And on a bittersweet note, this week as we welcome our new producer, Ariel, to the team, I also must share that today is Robin Vincent's last day with the show. She's relocating to the Midwest. Maybe she misses mosquitoes and humidity. I don't know. But I do want to take a moment here to share how incredible it has been to work with Robin. She's been the show's executive producer since day one. And I know In the NoCo would not be what it is today without her outstanding journalism skills and thoughtful editorial leadership. Robin, I'm so excited to see and read what you do next. And please know you'll be so missed here at KUNC. And that's it for us today here on In the NoCo. We'll be back with you next week with more of what's happening in Northern Colorado. I'm Erin O'Toole. Have a great weekend.